Hello once again from Heirloom Books at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Jeff Helgeson, and today my somewhat ambitious subject is a number of rather less than straight-laced writers from the Victorian age, the period of time between 1837 and 1901, while Queen Victoria occupied the throne of England, overseeing a worldwide colonial empire, for better or worse, upon which it was said the sun never set and which had abolished slavery about 30 years before the American Civil War. In brief summary, this 65 years was the era of the Industrial Revolution, the Potato Famine in Ireland, the Crimean War, pitting an allied countries of England, France, and Turkey against an imperialistic Russia in southeast Ukraine, the publication of Charles Darwin's Origin of Species and Descent of Man, as well as the works of Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche, the emergence of the novel as a dominant literary form, and the development of the camera, resulting in such radical evolutions with respect to visual art as Impressionism, and the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, something that essentially encompassed painting and the crafts of furniture making and stained glass design, along with printing and poetry. The time is also thought of as having been highly conservative and very socially proper. Victorian, in fact although many of its authors may run somewhat counter to that particular stereotype, making their lives, as well as the works that they created, significant topics of interest. As J.B. Priestley points out in his book, Literature and Western Man, this was a period of time when more and more people, a large proportion of them middle-class women, wanted something to read but did not see themselves as patrons, connoisseurs, or students of literature. Writers who were active over these several decades within Great Britain included Elizabeth Barrett and Robert Browning, Alfred Lord Tennyson, Charles Dickens, William Thackeray, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, and his sister, Christina, Algernon Swinburne, and Oscar Wilde. Initially within the shadow cast by the earlier generation of Romantics, poetry remained a force throughout the Victorian age, even while serialized popular fiction, a little like contemporary limited streaming online series, became a more dominant culture phenomena. In terms of poets, Elizabeth Barrett, the child labor opposing abolitionist daughter of a Jamaican invested landowner, was born in 1806, six years prior to her eventual husband, Robert Browning, uh, by means of an un sanctioned elopement against never resolved parental opposition, and she was considered for being appointed England's Poet Laureate when William Wordsworth died, although the post ultimately went to Tennyson. She had grown up in northern England, at the age of 16 suffered a spinal injury in a horseback riding accident, resulting in the concentration of her efforts upon studying several languages, doing a translation of Aeschylus, Prometheus Bound, eh, perhaps as a kind of English language prequel to Percy Besieged Shelley's Prometheus Unbound, and publishing two volumes of verse that prom prompted Robert Browning to begin a correspondence with her, which eventually led to their escape as a couple to Italy, where the two poets lived throughout the remaining 
15 years of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's life before her death from a sudden illness while held in the arms of her loving husband. It was there that her famous Sonnets from the Portuguese were written, a title derived from Robert's nickname for her, the Little Portuguese, thanks to her admiration for an epic poet from Portugal and including the most famous of the 44 love poems, the penultimate, How Do I Love Thee? Let Me Count the Ways. Uh, for Robert, of course, there was the equally famous My Last Duchess, in which he suggests that the Duke of Ferrara, the speaker in this dramatic monologue, had ordered his young wife's death because she hadn't sufficiently appreciated his gift of a 900-year-old name while at the same time preparing to negotiate the dowry for her replacement. Alfred, Lord Tennyson, eventual choice to succeed Wordsworth as Poet Laureate, had been the child of a clergyman, a disinherited eldest son who had turned to drugs and alcohol. In addition to retelling the legend of King Arthur in Idols of the King, revisiting Homer's aging hero of the Odyssey in a quest to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield, and providing a prophecy of such things in his poem Loxley Hall as aerial combat among nations, ending in a yet-to-be-truly-realized Parliament of Man and Federation of the World. Tennyson contributed such phrases to the English language is, it is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all, and from his Crimean War poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade, there's not to make reply, there's not to reason why, there's but to do and die. Into the valley rode the, the valley of death rode the 600. As for English novelists, who J.B. Priestley describes as having come out of a rapidly growing, sprawling, untidy society, a significant pair of opposites can be seen in Charles Dickens and William Makepeace Thackeray. Born just a year apart, Thackeray in 1811 and Dickens in 1812, the tale of these two writers <coughs> could not have been more different with respect to their early life experiences, Thackeray being the son of an East Indian Company official who inherited a fortune at the age of five when his father passed away, and Dickens, uh, the child of an impoverished British Navy payroll clerk who was sent to debtor's prison, forcing his ten-year-old son into the child labor force in order to help his family uh, make ends meet. Conceivably, the empathy expressed by Dickens for the concerns of the poor and less fortunate in society, and Thackeray's characterizations of the hypocrisies of the aristocracy and upper classes were the result of these very different backgrounds, even though after attending Trinity College, Cambridge, where, in spite of a friendship with Tennyson, Thackeray was said to have been eh, careless of university distinction, and having squandered his inheritance, searching for a job, first sought to become the illustrator for Charles Dickens' Pickwick Papers, after Robert Seymour, the original artist for the serial publication, had done committed suicide. But then, not having obtained that position, out of financial necessity, Thackeray began addressing himself to journalism and literature as a source of both fame and fortune, producing such works as the satirical Vanity Fair, which has since inspired two separate by about 50 years, 
incarnations of a monthly popular culture, fashion, and current affairs magazine, The Luck of Barry Lyndon, inspiration for Stanley Kubrick's 1975 epic film, and such other works as <coughs> A Shabby Genteel Story, The Book of Snobs, and The Virginians. With Dickens, the story was both entirely different and ultimately very much the same, having gained fortune and fame from his writing before Thackeray, albeit through a very different course of events. Following release from debtor's prison, his father, over maternal objections regarding the pressing need for household income, had managed to get young Charles enough education to eventually qualify for employment in various law offices, leading to his becoming a successful freelance legal reporter. At about this time, Dickens also fell in love with the flirtatious young woman named Maria Beadnell, who ultimately rejected his attentions, apparently causing the young writer to marry another woman named Catherine Hogarth on the rebound, um, the eldest of his editor at the Evening Chronicle's three daughters, the youngest of whom died of an illness in Dickens' arms at the tender age of 18, while the other, Georgiana, remained with the writer throughout his life, including long after he had separated from her older sister well, after beginning an affair at the age of 46 with an 18-year-old actress named Ellen Nell Turnan, possibly as the result of the noted author, allegedly, having fathered a son with his wife's surviving sister. But I digress. What's truly important for posterity, in addition to the significant effects of Dickens' work on the improvement of social conditions for the poor, as observed by literary critic Alan Bloom, is the unforgettable characters that he created, allowing, as Bloom observes, subtlety in our distinction of human types. The personalities drawn from his life experiences which populate Dickens' 15 novels and the ever-popular novella, A Christmas Carol, altogether having been given 129 film adaptations, include such unforgettable individuals as Ebenezer Scrooge, Mr. Pickwick, Miss Havisham, Oliver Twist, David Copperfield, Little Nell, Nicholas Nickleby, Uriah Heep, Martin Chiselwit, Fagin, and the Artful Dodger. A great number of them being depicted in the painting by R. W. Buss, which uh, hangs in the Dickens home in London and demonstrates what Priestley termed a kind of imagination fed by the unconscious. Then there's also the opening and closing sentences of the uh, French revolutionary novel, A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and the self-sacrificing on the platform of the guillotine is a far, far better thing I do than ever I have done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than ever I have known. As for William Thackeray, in terms of former Beatle John Lennon's observation that life is what happens while one is busy making other plans, there was the challenge of his wife and the mother of his three daughters eventually going insane and being committed to an asylum where she then outlived her husband by another half century. Now, with regard to Dante Gabriel Rossetti, he was a poet and painter who founded 
what he called the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, a kind of reactionary protest against industrialization that reached back for inspiration to a time before the Renaissance. Although Dickens had sarcastically wondered why not just a pre-Galileo movement to merely go back prior to applied science. Having married the model of many of his early paintings, Elizabeth Siddle, when she apparently committed suicide while Rossetti was having dinner one evening with Al poet Algernon Charles Swinburne, perhaps as a result of postpartum depression, shortly following the delivery of a stillborn child, the grieving husband buried a manuscript of his poems with her, which later had to be exhumed and disinfected for a period of several months before being submitted for publication. Rossetti then began an affair with another model, Jane Burden, introducing her to his best friend at the time, the arts and crafts designer William Morris, who subsequently married her, creating a romantic triangle that seems to have continued for a number of years within a jointly owned home that was described as having been surrounded by a strange garden occupied with an extraordinary collection of animals, including amadillos, kangaroos, wombats, and a zebra. Christina Rossetti, who, according to Louis Untenmeyer in Lives of the Poets, was her oldest brother's complete opposite, also both drew and wrote poetry, as well as having modeled for her brother as a terrified Virgin Mary, receiving the news that she had been chosen among women to give birth to the uh, Son of God. After an older sister took vows as a nun, Christina spent most of her life caring for their invalid mother and wrote in perhaps one thinly veiled autobiographical poem. She gave up beauty in her tender youth gave all her hope and joy and pleasant ways. She covered up her eyes, lest they should gaze on vanity, and shows the bitter truth. Um, by contrast to this selfless life choice, her brother's friend and fellow poet, just barely five foot four inch tall, Algernon Swinburg, the aristocratic son of a high-ranking British naval officer and notorious fan of flagellation, was described by Oscar Wilde, according to Michael Schmidt's Lives of the Poets, as setting out to prove himself a homosexual and bestializer without ever having done anything about either vice. Although, in his poem titled The Leper, Swinburne managed to pretty much go Rossetti one better by idealizing necrophilia with his beautiful use of language in the lines six months and I still sit and hold in two cold palms her two cold feet her hair half gray half ruined gold thrills me and burns me in kissing it. And then there was Oscar Wilde. The picture of Dorian Gray, <coughs> the importance of being earnest, Salome, Lady Windermere's fan, and a 65,000 word letter from reading prison to Alfred Douglas, his obsessive object of desire and the son of the boxing rule inventing Marquis of Queensbury, who Wilde somewhat unadvisedly had sued for slander regarding an insinuation of homosexual associations with the Marquis offspring, ultimately resulting in the author's unanticipated 
reversal of fortune, conviction, and imprisonment for sodomy. Rather ironic twist of fate that pretty much sketches out the reputation which Wilde made for himself as someone who lived the life that Swinburne had merely imagined while also having been a husband and the loving father of two sons. Among the comments that Oscar Wilde is noted for having made, there are, be yourself. Everyone else is taken. You can never be overdressed or overeducated. I don't want to go to heaven. None of my friends are there. Experience is merely the name that everyone gives to his mistakes and hearts are made to be broken in addition to the assertion in his essay the um, soul of man under socialism that slavery was put down in America not in consequence of any action on the part of the slaves or even any expressed desire on their part that they should be freed. Dying in poverty in Paris in 1900, Oscar Wilde preceded Queen Victoria into the grave by merely a single year. He was 46 and she was 82. In addition to the authors mentioned who largely defied the area's stereotype of the years of Queen Victoria's reign, also saw the appearance of such works as Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach, the novels of Thomas Harding, such as Far From the Maddening Crowd, Jude the Obscure, and Tess, as well as the early works created by George Bernard Shaw. Next to the period of creativity surrounding the rule of Queen Elizabeth I, it would seem that the Victorian age was perhaps one of the greatest in English literature, even though many of its writers were in fact greatly removed from the conventional image of respectability associated with that period of time. Although, of course, there was also the uh, conspiracy theory that the Queen's grandson, Prince Albert Victor, had actually been the notorious prostitute murderer Jack the Ripper. But that, as the saying goes, is a highly questionable other story. I'm Jeff Helgeson, and Heirloom Books is located at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois.